27 and counting. The Caribbean. Ria Kessir. Wow! In the onboard theater of a cruising luxury liner, a deck chair lifted off the stage, carrying a nervous looking volunteer from the audience, while the 10 year old sandaled feet dangled over 10 feet above the boards. Inconspicuously seated in a back row, Mary Marvel joined in the applause. Since dropping in uninvited on the SS Lamaris, she'd learned a thing or three about cruise ships. One, it was a cinch to sneak aboard when you could fly. Two, on a boat full of tourists living out of their suitcases, almost anything passed as evening wear, even her slinky new costume. Three, they sometimes booked top talent for their passengers' entertainment. Zatanna Zatara, her real name, was probably the world's most famous female magician. Her trademark top hat, tails, and fishnet stockings had been mimicked by countless imitators, but there remained only one Zatanna. Ruder at roof. Wow! The chair touched down upon the stage, <laughs> and the pint-sized volunteer wasted no time hopping off the seat. Thanks for your help, Tommy. What do you say, folks? Let's give our brave volunteer a hand. Probably only Mary knew that Satana's magic was no mere trickery. It was the genuine article. When she wasn't performing on stage, Zatanna often used her mystical gifts to defend humanity from all manner of occult menaces. Back in Gotham, the Riddler had suggested that Mary needed a mentor. As much as she hated to admit it, he might have had a point. And who knew more about combining magic and heroism than Zatanna? She had even once been part of the Justice League. Ah, please! We can all see you did it with wires! <laughs> nice try, darling. But your talent's all in your legs. Shall we see if the same holds true for you? Emotsak Ekila Naid! What? Oh my god! The drunk's loud Hawaiian shirt and Bermuda shorts instantly transformed into an ill-fitting knockoff of Wonder Woman's star-spangled costume, complete with gilded bustier and tiara. Oh! <laughs> That's showing him, Z! After the show, Mary was waiting impatiently by the stage door when a hand gently dropped onto her shoulder. Hello, Mary. What brings you here? You knew I was here? I sensed you from the stage. All that magic and anger was hard to miss. You seem troubled, Mary. Um, to be honest, I was hoping we could talk. All right. Let's get some fresh air. They strolled out onto the promenade deck outside. I'm surprised your fans are leaving us alone. Zatanna was still decked out in her tucks and tights after all, while Mary's costume could easily be mistaken for that of a magician's lovely assistant. I figured we'd be swamped by ardent admirers and autograph seekers. <laughs> I cast a low-level cloaking spell over us. We're not exactly invisible, per se, just flying below the radar. Satana leaned back against the guardrail. So how can I help you, Mary? Well, it's kind of a long story. I suppose it starts after our battle with Black Adam. Mary didn't know Zatanna well, but Z's friendly down-to-earth manner made her easier to talk to than, say, Madame Xanadu or even Billy. Mary filled Zatanna in on everything that had happened to her since waking up from her coma, including the extreme measures she had employed against the likes of Clayface and Pharyngula. Z listened patiently to the entire story, neither interrupting nor judging her. After what had happened at the Rock of Eternity, Mary appreciated Zatanna taking the time to hear her side of the story. I see. What happened to Black Adam? He... he just... left. So here I am, with all this magic and <laughs> no instruction manual. I mean, it's not like I haven't had power before, but it's not quite the same. And there's so much of it. I know. I can feel it surging inside you, almost like... A sudden disturbance off the starboard bow interrupted her diagnosis. Blazing yellow bolts of energy shot from the sea into the clear night sky. Only 70 yards away from the ship, the sea churned and foamed violently. Ten-foot waves rocked the Lamaris, sending passengers tumbling onto the deck. Hang on. I'm going for a closer look. Be careful, Mary. We don't know what forces are at work here. Don't worry about me. I'm not exactly an amateur, you know. 
Mary experienced a flash of irritation at Zatanna's needless coaching. Coruscating rays of light sizzled all around Mary as she zoomed defiantly into the midst of the barrage. I can take care of my... Oh. A tremendous water spout erupted from the sea below her. The geyser slammed into Mary with titanic force, knocking the wind out of her while simultaneously drenching her from head to toe. Her nose and eyes filled with salt water. Mary almost didn't notice that the eruption had hurled a humanoid figure toward the vulnerable ocean liner. Mary, we've got company. I see him, I see him. The blurry figure was already arcing down toward a deck full of stunned passengers who seemed frozen in shock. Move, you idiots. Even pouring on the speed, she knew she couldn't get there in time. Fortunately, Satana was also on the scene. An order of Ebon Cab! A wave of invisible force gently but firmly cleared the area directly in the path of the falling body. Nayatska! She got the bystanders out of the way with only seconds to spare. The mysterious figure crashed onto the deck, reducing a discarded deck chair to splinters. Oh my god! What the heck is that? Not human, that was for sure. Although a torn blue and white wetsuit concealed much of the creature's burly muscular form, scaly green skin covered his face and webbed hands, while more scale showed through the ragged tears in his garment. A spiked coral helmet missing its face visor protected his skull, sharpened claws extended from his fingertips. Still and silent, he sprawled lifelessly upon the soaked deck. Scorch marks blackened portions of his wetsuit. Mary descended toward the figure. Wait a second, I know who that is. The wisdom of Zahuti, the ancient Egyptian god of learning, informed her that the collapsed merman was none other than Slig, an evil new god from Apocalypse. He was the commander of the Deep Six, a strike force of water-breathing warriors that had invaded Earth's oceans on more than one occasion. The last that she'd heard, they'd given Aquaman a hard time during the Infinite Crisis. What's he doing here? And where's the rest of the six? Watch out, Mary! Water dripped from Zatanna's long black hair. He could be dead? Dangerous. Slick's eyes snapped open, revealing slitted red orbs. <laughs> Death! He scrambled to his feet, looking just as panic-stricken as the freaked-out vacationers. His open jaws revealed shark-like pointed teeth. Death comes for me! I must escape his wrath! Go, Jafar, Kur, and all my deep six brothers dead by his hand! Whose hand? Spill it, fish boy! What are you babbling about? Ignoring Mary, he slid across the wet deck with unexpected speed. Webbed fingers closed around the ankle of an unlucky tourist. <laughs> who instantly underwent a startling metamorphosis. Gills formed along the poor guy's throat. Fins sprouted from his arms and legs. Scales spread across his skin. His Hawaiian shirt and Bermuda shorts were torn to shreds by the violent transformation. Ah! Worthless dry skins! Slid charged into a dense clump of passengers. As he grabbed onto them one after another, arms and legs turned into tentacles. Bony shells covered flailing bodies. Mortal men and women evolved into hybrid sharks, barracudas, eels, cephalopods, and crustaceans. You shall be reborn as beasts of the sea! The better to mask my escape! Mary shook herself out of her shocked stupor. Hey, sea monkey, knock it off! Mary dived at the berserk sea god, seizing his helmet with both hands. Her anger exploded in a flash of eldritch light lightning that went off right in his face. Ah! Foul creature! What have you done to me? The glare faded away, revealing scarred white eyes, surrounded by scalded green flesh. Greasy yellow tears leaked from the smoking sockets. I'm blinded! Ah, stop being such a crybaby! Mary struggled to hold on to her slippery foe, who thrashed wildly within her grasp. Mary, back down a notch until we find out what this is all about. Ah, foolish human! You don't understand! The killer is here! What killer? You're the one causing all the trouble! Slig went flying backward into a steel bulkhead, shattering a solid glass porthole. Cold red blood streamed from his flattened snout as Mary followed up. I'm gonna turn you into fish sticks! Mary, I said back down! 
What's wrong with you? There are innocent people here. We need to attend to them. Zatanna pointed at the mass of transformed humans moving toward them, apparently compelled to defend Slig. By now, the promenade deck resembled some sort of bizarre aquatic freak show as mutated monstrosities flopped and slithered towards Zatanna. Okay, now that's disgusting. No matter what happened to them, they're still innocent people, Mary. We have to help them without hurting them. Gee, see, I'm not a moron. I saw what happened. Just make with the magic. Zatanna raised her hands and gestured dramatically. Trevor, oh, now move wrong. Oh, what, what, what happened to me? You're safe now, sir. A glowing figure burst from the sea, radiating a blinding white light, momentarily turning night into day. <laughs> Shielding her eyes with her hand, Mary tried to see who it was, but the incandescent glare was too intense. All she could make out was a vaguely masculine silhouette. Forced to look away, Mary saw that the stranger's explosive entrance had dragged up several other figures in its wake. Scaly corpses, bearing a distinct familial resemblance to Slig, drifted lifelessly to the surface of the foaming water. Gaping green holes in the center of the chests of the five new gods informed Mary exactly why Slig was scared out of his mind. That's it. I'm contacting the Justice League. This is getting way too cosmic for the two of us. No way! I am not going to sit back and let other people do my job. Your job? No! The killer is here! I can feel it! Slig dropped to his knees before the radiant figure. Uh, Slig shall be a humble servant! I will spit in the face of dark side if only you will give me my life! Look out! A beam of golden light shot from what might have been the eyes of the Deep Six's murderer. The golden ray passed right through Mary, producing only a slight tickling sensation before taking a sharp downward turn toward the prostrate slig. A steaming cavity, identical to the ones carved out of his comrades' chests, left Slig just as dead as the rest of the Deep Six. His assassin shot up into the sky. In a heartbeat, he had completely vanished, leaving only his grisly handiwork behind. Wow. I've seen some brutal things before, but... Mary! A little help here! Stalking across the deck, the transformed passengers seemed intent on avenging their master's death. Ignatch! Ignatch, come! A handful of monsters reverted to human form, but many more creatures remained. Zatanna was backed up against the rail as she attempted to muster the strength for another spell. This is taking too long! Mary swooped over the heads of the remaining sea devils, then paused in midair. Closing her eyes, she instinctively called upon the power of Isis. What are you doing? An encouraging voice whispered inside Mary's brain. Fixing things faster! Mary's eyes opened, revealing glowing orbs ablaze with mystical fire. Electricity crackled around her floating body, then struck the milling creatures below. Lightning strikes instantly transform scales, fins, and shells back into their skin. The battle-scarred promenade deck abruptly went from being a mutant aquarium to an impromptu nudist colony. Disoriented men and women tried awkwardly to cover themselves. Zatanna spared the mortified passengers any further embarrassment. She conjured up a slew of blankets from the ether. The gray wool blankets descended like manna from heaven, draping themselves over the trembling tourists. Mary was still too exhilarated by her own triumph to worry about anyone's modesty. Zatanna regarded Mary with new eyes. I didn't realize you had that kind of power. Uh, let's just be happy that we averted what could have been a major maritime disaster. I suppose. Mary, I'm concerned about you. Me? Whatever for? <laughs> I feel terrific. Twenty-six and counting. Apocalypse. Everything dies. Torches illuminated the Spartan war room as Darkseid contemplated the inanimate replica of Slig in his grip. He removed the other figures of the Deep Six from his chessboard. And like the Prometheans before them, 
so shall the new gods pass into the Stygian depths of oblivion. They are but pawns, sacrificed in a battle beyond their primitive conceptions of life and death. At the end of an age where time, space, and reality will bow before me, only dark side shall rise to wield universal power and decide who lives and dies in the new multiversal dynasty. He crushed the figure in his fist, and painted green powder rained down onto the chessboard. Random flecks settled onto the adjacent figures of Mary Marvel and Zatanna. And the game continues. Twenty-five and counting. Gotham City, Earth-15. After several fruitless trips to other strange parallel Earths, the new Challengers of the Unknown appeared in an open plaza inside a peaceful city park. Metal benches and waste bins lined the paved square. Moonlight filtered through the bare branches of venerable oaks and elm trees, and a geyser of water rose from the center of a concrete fountain. <coughs> so where the hell are we now? Earth-15. Gotham City. Right. Now that she had a chance to get her bearings, Donna recognized the familiar skyline of Jason's hometown. Gloomy Gothic architecture mingled with modern high-rises. The corporate headquarters of Wayne Enterprises, all gleaming glass and steel, shone like a beacon in the dark. A clock tower informed her that it was five past midnight, which explained why the park appeared to be deserted. Are you sure? It looks too... clean. Not all versions of Gotham City are as filthy and crime-ridden as your own. Oh, yeah? Then why don't I just make myself feel more at home? Jason kicked over a trash can, spilling garbage onto the pavement. Jason, please... No, Donna! I'm getting sick and tired of this wild goose chase. Jason wheeled about to get into the monitor's face. You're a monitor. Your people are supposed to see all and know all, and you can't even find one guy? It is more complicated than you realize, human. Each monitor is responsible for only one of the 52 universes, and it is forbidden for us to interfere outside our own jurisdiction. The monitor glanced around apprehensively, as though half expecting to face the judgment of his peers at any moment. I watch over only the universe containing your own world, Earth-1. This universe is under the purview of another monitor. We should not be here. But can't you ask your fellow Monitor for assistance? Surely he, or she, would know if Ray Palmer was here. That would not be wise. There has been dissension amongst our ranks over such issues. Each Monitor guards his own territory zealously, and I fear we do not always see eye to eye. But if you explained the importance of our mission, made the other Monitors understand what was at stake. And what would that be? And how does that involve my city? Donna looked up in surprise to see Batman, or at least a Batman, landing in front of them. The Dark Knight wasn't alone, either. Wonder Woman hovered in the sky above them. Her star-spangled skirt, gilded breastplate, and jeweled tiara were almost identical to those Wonder Woman wore back on Earth-1. Diana? Donna's jaw dropped as she recognized this Wonder Woman's face. This world's Wonder Woman is... me? I don't know who or what you people are, but I'll tell you this. I don't like imposters. Wait! Before there is any unneeded conflict between us, I can explain our presence here. Good. Wonder Woman lassoed the Monitor with her golden lariat, binding his arms to his sides. The lasso of Hestia will ensure that you speak the truth. Your primitive magics are unnecessary. My companions and I are from a parallel version of your planet, and have no intention of posing as anything other than what we are. An alternate Earth? You truly expect us to believe you? Hey, your voice. Sounds like mine, I already noticed that. Donna was startled. That wasn't Bruce Wayne. It was another version of Jason. Still wearing a domino mask, huh? Guess you never made the leap from sidekick to team leader. I don't need a string of snot-nosed boy wonders traipsing after me. I'm my own man now. Then you only have one person to disappoint. Before the two men could go at it any further, a miniature figure suddenly appeared on Batman's shoulder. Glowing atomic orbitals circled the tiny figure, who grew from one inch to doll-sized in a matter of seconds. 
the atom. Donna's heart leapt in excitement until she realized that this atom was a woman. Springing from Batman's shoulder, the brightly costumed heroine assumed normal human proportions as she landed on the ground before them. Her red and blue uniform matched the other atoms, right down to the stylized atomic insignia on the forehead of her hood, but her long blonde ponytail and feminine figure made it abundantly clear that she was not Ray Palmer. I knew there was a multiverse! I've been trying to prove its existence since I was five! How did you make it through the interdimensional barrier? Never mind that. Why are you here? We're trying to find a friend. He's our Earth's version of the Atom. There's another me out there? Fascinating. This chick is your Atom? What is she, 12? For your information, I'm 18. Who the hell are you supposed to be, the smart-ass Robin? Wonder Woman alighted onto the pavement and released the monitor from the Golden Lariat. Jessica Palmer is the Atom. She graduated from MIT at the age of eight. We don't know these people, Donna. Stop handing out personal information. Don't be paranoid, Jason. My lasso confirms that they're telling the truth. Donna shook her head. Their counterpart's debate had a familiar ring to it. This was like looking into a funhouse mirror. Even so, why are we helping these people? I'm not convinced they know what they're doing. You want to test that theory? Don't have to. I've already calculated it in my head. Of the 300 possible attack sequences you might try, given the distance and environment, the outcome would be the same. You'd lose. Batman turned his back on Jason, dismissing him. Jason lunged at Batman from behind. You son of a bitch! <laughs> Batman flung out his cloak like a matador's cape, snaring Jason in its voluminous depths, and he couldn't stop Batman from expertly flipping him onto the pavement. Attack from the rear. A sure sign of weakness. The Dark Knight's boot pressed down on Jason's chest, pinning him to the ground. Looks like I'm better at being you. Donna and Wonder Woman exchanged disgusted looks. If you two macho jerks are done comparing jockstrap sizes, maybe we can actually get down to the business of finding Ray Palmer? He's not on our Earth. A shadow fell over the nocturnal scenery as a soaring figure descended from the sky. Supergirl? Superwoman. The woman's costume echoed that of her celebrated cousin. She seemed older and more mature than the flighty teenage heroine Donna remembered from back home. You didn't need to get involved in this. We were handling it on our own. It's no problem. I scanned the Earth from my fortress in the Arctic. Your Adam is not here. I'm afraid this was a wasted trip. I wouldn't say that. Donna smiled at her twin. Being here is like looking into a crystal ball where all your dreams are realized. It gives one hope. Ah, <sighs> sentimental musings aside, we have to go. We have many more worlds to search. Your quest can wait just a while longer. Wonder Woman took Donna by the hand. Sister, may I have a word alone with you? Puzzled, Donna glanced at Jason and the monitor. You must make it brief. She let Wonder Woman guide her down a tree-lined path until they were out of earshot of the others. What's this all about? I sense confusion within you. An uncertainty I myself once knew too well. When mighty Zeus learned his first wife, Metis, was pregnant... He consumed her lest the son she carried supplant him upon the throne of the gods. But swallowing Metis caused Zeus great suffering. To rid himself of the pain, he instructed Hephaestus to split open his head. And from that wound was born Athena, goddess of wisdom. Ultimately, Athena was the only one of Zeus's many offspring that he entrusted with his magic shield and the secret of his lightning bolts. I'm familiar with the story. My point is not to mold your life around what you believe others expect. If you are indeed destined to become the Wonder Woman of your world, then you will be. Donna found herself revealing hidden doubts that she would never have dared divulge to anyone except, well, herself. But you don't understand. I have no real past of my own. I was magically created from a fragment of the real Diana's soul when she was just a child. I sprang into existence from out of nowhere. Then you have much in common with Athena. Oh. Donna had never really thought about it like that before. She wasn't sure quite how to respond. Donna had to admit that Athena did all right for herself, despite her unorthodox origins. All right, ladies, time's up. Mr. Monitor is getting restless, and if I hear him muttering about the Great Disaster one more time, I'm gonna kill him. 
and then we'll be stuck here for good. Indeed. I must not delay your quest any further. My thanks for your patience. She took Donna's hand again. I hope my words will provide you with some comfort in the days to come. You've given me a lot to think about. Donna gave her twin's hand a grateful squeeze. Thank you. They followed Jason back to the plaza, where the Monitor and this Earth's heroes awaited them. Now Barbie-sized, the female Adam turned to face Batman as she perched upon his shoulder once more. Admit it, Jason. Doesn't it make you feel better to know that Bruce is still alive somewhere in another incarnation? It makes no difference to me. Uh-huh. She placed her miniature palm beneath his chin. Let's see. Sudden intake of breath, slight increase in heart rate, an almost imperceptible catch in the voice. Huh. Once a boy wonder, always a boy wonder. Can it, Tinkerbell? Are we quite ready to depart? I hope you will not need to indulge in such time-consuming social activities at every continuum we visit. The fate of worlds without end may depend upon... Before he could finish his familiar admonition, a blinding golden glow lit up the night. I don't like the looks of this. Donna's eyes widened in surprise as a second monitor emerged from the transporter beam. Brother, this ends now! Twenty-four and counting. Metropolis. Exhausted by his escape from the underground laboratory, Jimmy climbed up out of the sewers and found himself back in suicide slum again. He was sore and tired and smelled like an open latrine, but his freakish metamorphoses and runaway powers had receded once he'd gotten far enough away from Project Cadmus's probes and scanners. He was just plain old Jimmy Olsen again, if only for the moment. That was good enough for him. Oh, right now, I just want to get back to my apartment and take the world's longest shower. I only hope I didn't wreck that lab too much before I slipped down the drain. Maybe I should write Dr. Serling an apology later on, once I'm feeling a little less disgusting. However, before he could go home and clean up, he needed to find something to wear. <sighs> Rummaging through a dumpster behind the neighborhood mission, he found a faded green t-shirt and a grimy pair of jeans. The clothes were a few sizes too big and weren't likely to land him on Metropolis's best dress list. Well, they'll have to do. The last thing I need is to get picked up for indecent exposure. He felt uncomfortably vulnerable without his signal watch, which he'd left behind at Cadmus, but he could always ask Superman for a spare the next time he saw him. He wriggled into the t-shirt and was just pulling on the jeans, when abruptly, an ominous shadow fell over him. There you are! I have found you at last! Oh, man. What now? An insectoid figure swooped down from the sky. Three pairs of scaly white wings flared out behind her, an ovoid helmet and body armor, made of a glossy chitinous material, protected the intruder but failed to disguise her feminine curves. Twin antennae sprouted from small openings in her crimson helmet. Her hard white exoskeleton concealed whatever softness might lie beneath the armor. Polished opals adorned her boots, belt, and gauntlets, and amber lenses in her faceplate hid her eyes. Who? I mean, what? With one leg in, one leg out of his jeans, Jimmy stumbled backward and turned to flee. Gloved fingers grabbed onto his collar with surprising strength. Whoa! Holding on to Jimmy with just one hand, the female insectoid soared upward into the clear blue sky, rapidly leaving the squalid alley behind. Jimmy held on to the loose jeans tightly as he dangled helplessly above the city. Within seconds, he was hundreds of feet in the air. Do not resist, Earthbug. Don't make me hurt you, lady! None of his oddball powers had kicked in, though. Did that mean he wasn't in serious danger yet? Highly unlikely. Not to mention unnecessary. I merely wish to have words with you, away from any lurking shadows. Years of being carried aloft by Superman had largely inured Jimmy to such heights, yet the stranger's precarious hold on his collar left him praying that she didn't have butterfingers. Who are you, anyway? Call me Forager. For it is my sacred duty to seek out answers and bring home the truth. Forager? Jimmy had once known another being by that name. A humanoid insect from New Genesis, home of the New Gods. 
His people, the bugs, dwelt in vast colonies beneath the surface of the planet, far below the floating palaces of the new gods, who largely regarded the humble bugs with disdain. Despite his lowly status, however, the original Forager had often fought beside Superman and the new gods in order to defend his people from Darkseid's insidious schemes. According to Superman, he had died saving the cosmos a few years ago. So who was this new Forager? Did she also hail from New Genesis? Obviously, she wasn't the same bug returned to life. The first Forager had been male, while, judging from her shapely thorax, his replacement was clearly female. Flying swiftly through the sky, she carried Jimmy downtown toward the Daily Planet building. Forager dropped him lightly onto the roof of the building. Whatever happened next, at least Jimmy was back where he belonged. Chances were that Clark, Lois, and Perry were only a few stories below. Unless they were out on assignment, of course. He wished again that he'd hung on to his signal watch. I know the question that burns in your mind right now. You do? Although tempted to bolt for the stairs, the fact that his powers hadn't manifested yet suggested that the stranger meant him no harm. Of course. Her wings folded in behind her. In a city of millions, why did I single you out? Actually, I'm mostly wondering if I can finish putting my pants on now. I require your help, Jimmy Olsen. You know me? Obviously. The new gods are being hunted by an unknown assassin. Yeah, I'm sort of working that story. Forager had to be from New Genesis, he figured, if she was investigating the murders of Sleaze and Light Ray. Anyone new bite the dust? Barda of Apocalypse. <gasps> Big Barda's dead? Although raised on hellish apocalypse, the statuesque warrior woman known as Barda had rebelled against Darkseid and forged a new life as a superheroine here on Earth, fighting alongside her husband, Mr. Miracle. Jimmy couldn't imagine how devastated Scott Free must be right now. Oh, no. That's awful. Far worse is the crux of the problem. Bad enough that their bodies are slain, but the souls of the murdered gods are lost. Could they have been spirited away by the assassin? Are they being held hostage even now, denied their rightful place beyond the source wall? Jimmy suddenly remembered the holographic wall that had materialized while he was being examined at Cadmus earlier, as well as the gaping holes in the chests of Light Ray and Sleaze. Had Barda's heart been missing as well? All these mysteries were connected somehow, he realized, but just as the Joker had taunted him, he still couldn't see the big picture yet. Maybe Forager held the missing pieces of the puzzle. Jimmy Olsen, you have had more contact with the new gods than any other Earthbug. Furthermore, you have been present at the deaths of two of the victims. I humbly request that you join my search for the missing souls. It may be the single most important quest our worlds will ever know. I, uh... I, I mean, um... I kind of got a lot of my own stuff going these days. This is more important than the needs of any single being. Whoever stole these souls is now in possession of a power the likes of which could destroy all of reality and bring about the creation of the fifth world. Jimmy was aware that the mythology of New Genesis held that the birth of the new gods had heralded the dawn of the fourth world, although he'd always been a little fuzzy on what exactly the previous three worlds had been. Oh man, you mean the end of the world. An impending cosmic crisis was way more than he had bargained for. At the moment, he was tired and filthy and wanted nothing so much as to go home and veg out for a while. Let the Justice League or the Teen Titans assist Forager on her quest. He just wanted the universe to leave him alone for a few hours. Was that too much to ask? On the other hand, hadn't he just told Serling Roquette that he was tired of only being Superman's sidekick? That he craved some grand destiny of his own? Well, here it was. Okay, Forager. I'm in. Excellent! Um... But could we maybe swing by my apartment first, for a quick shower, change of clothes, and a snack? I haven't eaten anything since breakfast. There's no time to waste. She pressed one of the translucent gemstones on her gauntlet, resulting in the appearance of a circular portal through time and space. A brilliant white light issued from the shimmering vortex, which hovered in the air before Jimmy, who immediately recognized it as a boom tube, a means of interstellar transport used exclusively by the new gods and their allies. 
Advanced alien circuitry far beyond mortal comprehension lined the inner walls of the tube, which seemed to stretch endlessly towards some unknown destination elsewhere in the cosmos. Via boom tubes, even distant new Genesis and Apocalypse could be reached in a matter of seconds. Wait a minute, you haven't even told me where we're going yet! Placing a palm against his back, <laughs> Forager shoved him through the portal into the intense white light, then dived in after him. The portal blinked out of existence. What was that? Attracted by the noise, Lois Lane came charging up onto the roof. Hello? Is anyone there? But the roof was empty. Outside Gotham City. Ekatsu Imo. Zatanna's magical incantation instantly transported her and Mary from the deck of the Lamaris to the front yard of a creepy Gothic mansion hidden away in the woods. Spiked turrets rose from the looming stone walls. Bat-winged gargoyles perched upon the battlements. Majestic columns and gabled arches adorned its brooding facade. Gray slate shingles seemed to swallow up the moonlight. A winding stairway, guarded by two stone griffins, led up to the imposing front entrance. Welcome to Shadowcrest. With the cruise ship's tour cut short by Slig's attack, Zatanna had graciously offered to tutor Mary in the privacy of the magician's home. The bat signal, shining in the distance, revealed that the woods were somewhere outside Gotham. Uh, I'm confused. I, I thought you lived in San Francisco. I do. Most of the time. Zatanna led Mary up the stone stairway. This is my father's estate, where I grew up. Mary recalled that Z's dad, the great Zatara, had also mixed showbiz with crime fighting. He had died saving the world several years ago. I still use the place as a getaway when I need to relax. A lamp flicked on overhead, illuminating the front porch. Who goes <gasps> there? Hang on, I've got to give the password. She faced the ponderous oak doors. Hi, I've brought some literature. Can I share the good word with you? <laughs> That's your password? It is today. There's a bit of voice recognition involved, too. A butler with cadaverous features greeted them. Very good, madam. Welcome. Holding aloft a lit candelabra, he led them into a spacious foyer where Mary was surprised to find an entire crew of uniformed manservants, maids, and housekeepers standing at attention. Intricate tapestries and oil paintings hung upon polished wood-paneled walls. Spotless marble tiles added to the elegance of the stately entry hall. A sweeping staircase ascended majestically toward the upper reaches of Shadowcrest. Holy moly, you must be loaded to be able to maintain a staff like this, at a place where you don't even spend much time. <laughs> I do all right. A crystal chandelier lit up the foyer. But not that well. The truth is, these servants are just magical manifestations of the house. They're only around when I need them. Fatsekat Ekerb. The entire retinue evaporated into thin air. <laughs> Pretty neat. And they'll just come back whenever you summon them? That's right. It's really pretty basic magic, Mary. The kind you'll be able to do when you're ready. Mary was eager to explore her new abilities, although she wasn't quite sure what Z meant about having to be ready first. After the way she had turned all those sea monsters back into the people aboard the cruise ship, Mary figured that she was ready right now. Lamps and candles flared up along their way as Zatanna led Mary up the main stairway, then guided her guest through the sprawling mansion, which was packed with antique furniture, eye-catching artwork, and fascinating souvenirs. Whoa, totally amazing! This place looked huge on the outside, but I swear it didn't look this big. Yep. This house has lots of surprises. Next stop on the tour is the library. It's just down here. But what are all these other rooms? A closed door inscribed with ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics caught her eye. An open sarcophagus propped up beside the door held what appeared to be a genuine Egyptian mummy. Its withered hands gripped a gleaming bronze scimitar. Given that her new powers derived from the bygone gods of the Nile, Mary was naturally intrigued. She reached for the doorknob. You've only shown me a fraction- Mary, wait! The mummy's shriveled eyelids snapped open. He swung the scimitar between the door and Mary, <gasps> the blade missing her by inches, driving her back. Maya Hoshura Maksha! Thanks, Hassan. It's all right. Ah, uh, The mummy settled back into his sarcophagus. Zatanna took Mary by the elbow, 
and gently escorted her away from the door in question. You're not ready for some rooms yet, Mary. Uh, okay. Mary looked back over her shoulder at the Egyptian door and its undead guardian. She couldn't help wondering what exactly Zatanna was hiding behind those hieroglyphics and why she wasn't willing to share that secret. What else was she keeping from Mary? Why did she keep insisting that Mary wasn't ready? As I was saying, the library. A pair of double doors opened by themselves, admitting the two women into an astonishingly large private library. Packed bookcases, several feet taller than either Mary or Zatanna, lined the walls. A spiral staircase led up to a mezzanine. Candles ignited in the chandeliers overhead. It took Mary a moment to realize that the chandeliers were actually floating in the air, unsupported by any chains or hooks. A fireplace came to life in one corner, casting a rosy glow on a nearby suit of armor. Wow! Mary felt as though she had accidentally stumbled into Hogwarts. Wandering over to the nearest bookcase, she scanned the spines of various leather-bound grimoires, demonologies, memoirs, bestiaries, and other esoteric volumes. The Book of Fate, the Arion Chronicles, Chaos and Order, the Morpheus Prophecies, the Journals of Lady Joanna Constantine. Some of these books look like they're centuries old. I don't even recognize a few of these languages. That's because they're not human languages. And most of these books go back a lot farther than hundreds of years. My family has been collecting them for a long time. Mary remembered hearing somewhere that Z was supposedly descended from Leonardo da Vinci, as well as from a secretive race of sorcerers known as the Homo Megai. You could say this is my bat cave. I study here, brainstorm here, practice here. A glass display case attracted Mary's attention. An oval mirror in a filigreed frame hung above it. Charms, crystals, amulets, orbs, rings, scarabs, fetishes, wands, and other talismans rested beneath a clear pane of glass atop a sheet of black velvet. <gasps> Look at all these! There's enough magical energy in that case alone to do pretty much anything you can imagine. Mary could believe it. She felt the talisman's sorcerous potential calling out to her, even through the thick glass sheet. <gasps> oh, it must be so wonderful to have so much power at your command. Just wonderful. It's also a big responsibility. Here. Satana dropped an armload of dusty tomes onto a waiting desk. These should get you started. We'll start with the basics, then work our way up to more challenging material. Mary hesitated, unable to tear herself away from the case. It was hard to get enthused about pouring through piles of moldy old books when all these delectable toys were right at her fingertips, just waiting to be played with. Oh, can't we test drive some of these? In time. But only after you've mastered the fundamentals. <sighs> Handing you such talismans now would be like giving a loaded gun to a child. Hey, I am not a child. If you think these stupid books are so great, you read them. Lightning leapt from Mary's fingertips, zapping the stacked volumes, which abruptly took flight. Flapping their covers, the airborne books swarmed Zatanna like pigeons descending on breadcrumbs. Skupatskin out! The now disenchanted tomes rained down onto the floor, but Mary had already found something better to do. Her fist smashed through the glass protecting Zatanna's trophies. Blue flames flashed momentarily as her innate magical strength overcame whatever protective wards that Zatanna had placed over the display case. Her eager fingers closed around a particularly tempting prize, a crystal-studded Atlantean scepter that positively reeked of magic. An ecstatic rush of energy thrilled her senses. Her skin tingled all over. Her hair stood up on end. Oh, no wonder you wanted to keep this for yourself. So much power. Mary, no! You can't cut loose like that in here. It's like tossing a match into a tinderbox. The power of the scepter, joined to Mary's own God's given might, intoxicated her. She raised the wand high above her head, glorying in the rapturous sensation. I came to you for help, Zatanna. I thought you were on my side. Why would you keep these things from me? Zatanna was jealous. Jealous of what Mary could become. That was the only explanation that made sense. That's enough. Redpex imok otem. An unseen force snatched the wand from Mary's hand. Hey! The precious talisman and all its irresistible magic returned to Zatanna. Mary felt as though she'd been dashed with a bucket of cold water. Lightning flashed in her eyes. You shouldn't have done that. You know, 
I thought that you might be some sort of sorceress savant, but it turns out you're just a brat, and you're about to get spanked. You give that back. It belongs to me now. Sigam Rerab Katarpam. A hastily erected bubble of pale blue energy shielded Zatanna from Mary's initial attack. Mary's gloved fists pounded against the infuriating force field. Magical shockwaves knocked Zatanna to the floor inside her bubble. Mary, stop! What's come over you? Maybe I finally caught on to the truth that you're no different from Billy or Madame Xanadu. You all want to keep me weak and helpless and docile. Well, to hell with that! Mary's fists smashed into the floor as the bubble instantly blinked out of existence, taking Zatanna with it. For a moment, Mary thought her opponent had retreated from the fight entirely. Then she heard Zatanna reappear several feet behind her. Summoning a Middle Eastern-looking brass lamp from a bookshelf. Like something out of the Arabian Nights, a djinn steamed out of the lamp. Swirling purple vapors materialized into a muscular figure with dark indigo skin, pointed ears, and scorching red eyes. His jet black hair was pulled back in a top knot, and a black goatee added to his Mephistophelian appearance, as did his arched black eyebrows. <laughs> The genie seized Mary from behind, pinning her arms to her side. His tight embrace would have crushed any ordinary girl. Nufarak! To no Trude! Treating me with kid gloves, huh? Big mistake, Z! Mary slammed the back of her head into the genie's face. He loosened his grip long enough for Mary to grab onto his wrists with both hands and yank them apart. She whirled around. I'm playing for keeps! Mystic energy crackled around her as she ripped the genie into fragmented wisps of smoke. It felt like tearing apart a wad of cotton candy. <laughs> the empty lamp dropped onto the floor. Mary turned on Zatanna. Oh, yo! Oh, you really had me fooled, Z! I thought we were friends! Why even bring me here, huh? To steal the power Black Adam gave me? To put me in one of your trophy cases?! She tackled Zatanna head on, <laughs> slamming Z into the bookcase behind her. An avalanche of witty tomes crashed down on Zatanna, half buried beneath her own library. The dazed magician struggled to climb out from beneath the disorderly heap of books. Mary! Please, you have to stop this. Mary's boots levitated above the carpet as she gazed down at the battered sorceress. Don't worry, Z. It'll be over before you know it. Then, nothing would come between her and all the powers Zatanna had selfishly hoarded away. It was all so obvious now. She never actually intended to teach Mary anything. She wanted to keep all this magic to herself. She couldn't stand that Mary was becoming more powerful than her. Mary decided to give Zatanna a taste of that power. Iram! Kulta et hurorim! As though possessed of a mind of its own, the guilt-framed mirror dived to its mistress's defense, sliding between Zatanna and her attacker, just as Mary released a lightning bolt. The bolt struck the silver glass and bounced back at Mary herself. It was a disoriented, perfectly ordinary Mary Batson, who now staggered back toward the picture window. What? Zatanna took immediate advantage of the situation. Swadinyepo! Glass pane swung open obediently. And Mary went hurtling through the cold air outside the mansion, sailing over the spiked fence surrounding the estate, finally crashing to earth in the grassy clearing beyond. Shakily, she climbed to her feet. No longer invulnerable, she felt sore all over. She was cold in her plain old jacket and jeans. Mary shook her head in confusion. She stared in dismay at her fists. Oh, my God. What was I doing? She ran up to the wrought iron gate of Shadowcrest, which refused to open for her. Zatanna! Please! Let me explain! The iron bars of the gate had twisted themselves into a rough approximation of a mouth. For violation of basic etiquette and decorum, and for acting in a generally nasty, evil manner, you are hereby banished 
dust from Shadow Crest hence forth. A heavy layer of fog billowed up from the ground, concealing the mansion entirely. Do not attempt to find this place, as it shall remain hidden from you forevermore. The spreading fog swallowed up the gates, as well as Satana's lavish estate, which vanished into the mists like Brigadoon. Wait! Wait! I didn't know what I was doing! This power! <laughs> Please, Atana, I need your help. Just please, please give me a second chance. Perhaps you're asking the wrong person. It took Mary a second to realize that the voice was not her own. <gasps> Shazam! Who said that? The one you're searching for. Right. Someone else out to take what's mine. Oh, I'm more like you than anyone. Follow my voice, and you'll see what I mean. This better not be another trick. Mary launched herself into the air. If nothing else, she wanted to find out just who had the nerve to invade her thoughts this way. Trust me, Mary. You won't be disappointed. Twenty-three and counting. Metropolis. Wait a sec. I thought this was supposed to be some sort of self-esteem workshop. Yes. A dark-haired staff worker fastened a polished bronze breastplate over Holly's chest. We're simply applying your ceremonial garb. Holly glanced down at herself. A skirt of studded leather straps hung below the molded bronze cuirass. Metal greaves protected her lower legs. Steel-toed leather boots encased her feet. Seriously? You do know this is battle armor, right? Nonsense. Now, let's get you into your purification helmet. Holly eyed the feline totem molded upon the bronze helmet. A nod to her short-lived stint as a substitute catwoman? Or just a coincidence? Holly was already uneasy about the fact that Harley Quinn knew all about her dubious past. Heck, she had nearly fled the shelter after Harley had dropped that bombshell on her in the spa. But the Joker's supposedly reformed former squeeze had insisted that Holly's secret was safe among her Athenian sisters. In the end, Holly had decided to hang around a little longer, mostly because she had nowhere else to go. Now she was starting to have second thoughts. What sort of self-help exercise required body armor? Come. The dressers led her out of the private room into a colonnaded hallway, where she found several similarly armored women gathered outside a pair of towering wooden doors. Judging from their body language and what Holly could see of their faces, the other women looked just as baffled as she was. Herded together, they looked like refugees from a Xena convention. What in the world? Holly recognized one of the armored girls as Trisha, another newcomer to the shelter. She gripped a nasty-looking forked weapon. Um, I couldn't help but notice that you're holding a trident. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Just seeing if you knew that. The African-American teenage runaway acted as though she had never held anything like it before. Holly noticed that some of the other girls were armed with maces, flails, whips, nets, and swords. Did Hawkman have a yard sale or something? Ponderous oaken door swung open. Holly hesitated upon the threshold, getting a bad feeling about this. She had never explored this part of the shelter, so she had no idea what lay ahead. Where have I seen this before? Was it in a movie? I'm pretty sure it was in a movie. Sure enough, the doorway led to an impressive recreation of an ancient Roman Colosseum, complete with a sawdust floor and high stone walls. A domed sunroof offered a tantalizing view of a clear blue sky. Visions of Russell Crowe fighting for his life flashed through Holly's mind. Oh yeah, I hated that movie. My glorious sisters, welcome to your future. Holly looked up to see Athena herself presiding over the occasion from a balcony overlooking the floor of the arena. 
an honor guard of spear-wielding Amazons flanked her. A velvet banner bearing the image of a gorgon's bleeding head hung below the balcony. Writhing serpents were embroidered along the fringes of the bunting. During her stay at the shelter, Holly had learned that these symbols had long been associated with the mythological Athena, who was the goddess of warfare as well as wisdom. According to the legends, it was Athena who had taught Perseus how to slay Medusa. Holly still hadn't decided if the woman above was the actual goddess or just a charismatic namesake like Maxi Zeus, a deranged Gotham gang lord who claimed to be the genuine king of the gods. She certainly looked like a goddess. Each of you has endured hardships. You have been overlooked, forgotten, trampled upon. Today, you will free yourselves from your past, eradicate your insecurities, and purify your souls. Unleash your fury, my sisters, and become warriors! Are you kidding me? These are runaway girls, not Spartans. Belying her words, Trisha suddenly turned on Holly. <laughs> Hours of training in hand-to-hand -hand combat came to Holly's rescue as she deftly ducked under the lethal overhand thrust. Momentum carried Trisha past and over her, <laughs> and she landed hard in the sawdust. Holly quickly checked and saw that the girl was unconscious, then looked around to see that Trisha hadn't been the only woman to respond to Athena's stirring oratory. Holly found herself smack in the middle of an all-out free-for-all. Studded maces dented helmets, armored bodies slammed against each other. Holly didn't want to hurt anyone, but with the melee raging all around her, she had no choice but to fight back in self-defense. Battling figures hemmed her in on all sides. A wild-eyed gladiator swung a mace at her head. <laughs> But Holly rolled beneath the blow, then jumped back up onto her feet, just in time to see another woman jabbing a sword in her direction. Two more fighters grappling in front of her blocked Holly's escape, so she grabbed onto their shoulders and used them for leverage as she swung around to kick the overeager swordswoman in the gut. The blade flew from the woman's hands as she tumbled backward onto the sawdust, nearly getting trampled by the brawling women nearby. She scrambled desperately after her sword, only to get kicked in the ribs by another girl. Holly's eyes lit up as she spied a leather bullwhip, Catwoman's weapon of choice, hey! in the hands of a young Hispanic woman a few feet away. The girl flicked the whip ineptly, obviously having no idea how to use it. It was embarrassing to watch. Holly elbowed the girl on the chin. <laughs> I'll take that. Thanks. And yanked the whip from her fingers. It felt reassuringly familiar. Holly couldn't work the whip the way Selena could, but she had picked up the basics over the years. She used it to carve out a little breathing room. That's better. Taking a moment to catch her breath, she saw that at least a third of the gladiators had already had the fight beaten out of them. Their bruised bodies were strewn about the floor of the arena. Thankfully, the majority of the brawlers possessed more enthusiasm than skill. They wielded the archaic weapons clumsily, exhausting themselves as well as their opponents. Holly guessed that most of them had never been in a real fight before. Selena could take out this whole bunch without even breaking a sweat. With maybe one notable exception. Holly spied another warrior cutting a swath through the inept gladiators. A bronze faceplate, fashioned in the semblance of the classical Greek mask of comedy, concealed the woman's features, but there was no mistake taking her fighting abilities. Twirling a blunt cudgel like a baton, she bludgeoned the daylights out of her adversaries while nimbly evading every blower thrust directed at her. She practically danced through the frenzied melee. None of the other women could even lay a hand on her. Better keep an eye out for funny face there. A pair of charging warriors distracted Holly from the mystery woman. Safety in numbers proved no protection, however, as Holly snapped her stolen whip. The lash wrapped itself around the lead attacker's waist, yanking her off her feet and directly into the path of her comrade. The partners went down and would not soon get up again. This whole thing was insane. What was so purifying about encouraging untrained, emotionally damaged girls to beat each other up? Holly glanced around to see who was next. Just in time to see the woman in the mask triumphantly spin the cudgel above her head before taking a bow, Holly realized belatedly that they were the last two women standing. Fine. If Funny Face isn't going to back down, then neither am I. To be honest, part of her was enjoying the workout. It had been a while since she'd kicked a little butt. Athena wanted a show? Okay. Holly would give her one. The hot sun shone down through the glass dome of her head. 
the stuffy atmosphere reeked of blood and sweat. She and Funny Face warily circled each other, taking each other's measure. Holly briefly wondered what the other woman's story was before pushing the thought aside. Win first, ask questions later. The woman in the mask made the first move. Holly darted under the strike and came up quickly behind Funny Face. Holding on to a length of whip with both hands, she wrapped it around the throat of the other woman like a garrot. The club slipped from her opponent's grasp as her fingers clutched at her neck. It was just like Selena always said, when in doubt, fight dirty. Of course, she also said, never drop your guard. Funny Face jabbed her armored elbow into Holly's side hard enough to dent the metal cuirass. The pain loosened Holly's grip on the lash, and the woman yanked the whip away from her throat. Springing forward onto her hands, she slammed the soles of her feet into Holly's lower jaw. Blood sprayed from a busted lip as Holly reeled backward, letting go of the whip, even as her acrobatic enemy flipped back onto her feet. Both women assumed defensive positions as they circled each other once more, this time unarmed. Holly's whip lay on the ground nearby, tantalizingly out of reach, along with her opponent's fallen club. You're pretty good. Holly needed to switch tactics and move this fight inside. Her eyes narrowed as she looked for an opening. The molded steel armor felt like it weighed a thousand pounds. She pined for her black leather catsuit. I have seen it! Holly waited until Funny Face lowered her guard before doing the same. The two combatants turned toward the balcony. Athena smiled down upon them. You are among the lucky ones who have passed this sacred test. You, along with a few select others, will be making the pilgrimage to Paradise Island to achieve full citizenship among the Amazons. What? Holly had heard of Paradise Island, of course. Everyone had. That was where Wonder Woman was from. A mystical realm, hidden somewhere in the Bermuda Triangle, inhabited only by a race of immortal women warriors. Like the underwater city of Atlantis or the bottle city of Candor, it was one of those legendary places you read about but never expected to visit. Awesome! <laughs> we both made it! Harley? Are you excited? I'm excited! We're going to Paradise Island! Holly had to admit that it sounded like a dream come true. Twenty-two and counting. Gotham City. Earth 15. This is a gross violation of your jurisdiction, brother. Your intemperate actions, however well-meaning, jeopardize the integrity of the multiverse. Although he obviously belonged to the same alien race, Donna noticed subtle differences between this monitor and the one who had recruited her and Jason. This monitor was clean-shaven for one thing, and instead of cornrows, his long black hair was knotted in the back. His futuristic armor looked equally formidable, though, and like his kinsmen, he towered a head or two above the ordinary-sized humanoids populating the park. Called it. Didn't I say this was serious bad news? Shut up, Jason. Nix Wotan. You do not belong here either. What business have you interfering in my affairs? You forced our hand, Solomon. Your reckless travels have not escaped the notice of the rest of our number. The monitor of this world wished to confront you on her own, but we persuaded her that a more unified response was desired. Therefore, I have been dispatched by our assembly to present our ruling. He crossed his arms over his chest. You will surrender yourself to my custody, and be returned to the nexus of realities, there to stand trial for crimes against the multiverse. Crimes? Everything I have done has been to save the multiverse from a universal threat! That's enough, both of you! Batman strode forward decisively. Superwoman, Wonder Woman, and the female Adam formed ranks behind him. I don't know which of you aliens is in the right, but this is my city and my world. The Justice League is taking charge of this situation right now! Nick Wotan glanced at the heroes in annoyance. You see? You have already disturbed the native inhabitants of this Earth! With a wave of his hand, he teleported them away from the scene. He turned his scarlet eyes on Donna and Jason. Moreover, you have violated multiversal law. 
By removing these humans from their own Earth and exposing them to realities they were never meant to encounter. No harm was done to Earth-1 by extracting these two. They are both anomalies who should have remained dead in the first place. They were expendable. What the hell? You chose us because we're supposed to be dead anyway? Donna was equally stunned. It made sense in retrospect. If they were to die on this quest or never make it back home, then their Earth would simply go back to the way it was before Jason and Donna returned from their graves. They were expendable, at least from a cosmic point of view. Not that this made her feel any less used. There are larger issues at stake than the disposition of these two humans. You must surrender to the will of the majority and abandon this forbidden campaign. Never! The end time that was foretold is fast approaching. Only Ray Palmer can avert the great disaster. Donna recalled that Kadesa, the pint-sized oracle of the Nanoverse, had said the same thing. This Palmer being you seek is without significance. Trust me, brother. He lives a life of no consequence. That remains to be seen. You will not come willingly? I shall not. Then you leave me no choice. Nix Wotan stretched out a gauntleted hand toward the challengers. Instantly, Solomon raised his own. The rival energy volleys flared brightly as they crashed together between the two monitors. Donna Troy, Jason Todd, get back! Not on your life! Jason charged forward. Uh. Until a sudden shockwave sent both him and Donna tumbling backward across the plaza. Donna slammed into a metal park bench. Jason splashed down into the fountain. Again? The dueling monitors appeared evenly matched. Uh. Uh. Their faces were contorted from the strain of their combat. The glare was so bright that Donna could barely tell them apart. This is futile! Wherever you flee, we will find you! Give up this madness! What of you? Would you kill me to preserve your precious rules? You cannot defile a sacred code with impunity! We must act as one! Then we are brothers no more! Dogma has blinded you all to the battle we face! Solomon raised his palms once more. His gauntlets still seemed to have plenty of juice in them. This could go on all night, Donna realized. Launching herself into the fray, she struck Wotan like a missile. Her fists slammed into his chest, knocking him off his feet. He fired back at her with energy blasts. But she deflected the burst with her Amazonian bracelets. Enough, Solomon! Aren't you the one who is always going on about wasting time in pointless battles? This is not your fight, Donna Troy! One for all and all for one, Solomon. This is our quest, too! Right. Count us in. Still dripping from his splashdown in the fountain, Jason drew a Glock from beneath his leather jacket. The bullets bounced off Nick's Wotan's personal force field. Pathetic. He lumbered to his feet and took aim. And hopeless. Jason! Donna zoomed toward this monitor's target, shoving Jason barely out of harm's way. The blast struck the revolutionary war statue behind him. Pulverized stone rained down on Donna as she shielded Jason with her body. Thanks, babe. I didn't know you cared. <laughs> Don't get any ideas. Solomon took advantage of the distraction created by Jason to nail Wotan with a powerful blast of his own. The other monitor slammed into the trunk of a sturdy oak, cracking it in two. The tree crashed down on top of him, momentarily trapping him beneath its weight. Solomon! Time to go? Decidedly. Solomon activated the controls on his gauntlet, and a shimmering transparent sphere appeared behind them. Quickly, before my brother recovers. Yeah, yeah, we know the drill. Jason sprinted into the sphere, with Donna right behind him. Solomon joined them inside the vessel. The portal closed automatically. <laughs> Halt! This is futile! You cannot escape us! Next, Wotan's energy blast jolted the sphere, throwing its passengers off balance, but the desperate monitor was too late. Outside the glowing walls of the globe, Earth-15 shimmered and faded like a mirage. Here we go again. Donna brushed the powdered stone from her star-flecked black leotard. Yeah, but to where?